Welcome to the Right Take Podcast, news, ideas, and conversations at the intersection of politics and culture, a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center. I will be your host, Mark Tapson. Welcome back to the Right Take Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Tapson. Thanks once again for joining me here at the intersection of politics and culture. You know, one aspect of the culture that I never really address is the arena of finance and economics. I confess that's an arena I'm a little ignorant of and don't personally find very compelling. When people talk high finance and economics, it doesn't really take long for my eyes to start glazing over, I admit. Now, that having been said, I am becoming more and more concerned about the impact on the culture of woke capitalism and environmentally conscious investing, because even though those topics don't grab as many headlines as, say, the gender ideology madness or critical race theory indoctrination in the classroom, woke capitalism and what they call sustainable investing are wreaking their own fundamental transformation of society, as Barack Obama would put it. I'm much more knowledgeable now about the scam of sustainable investing because I just finished reading a brand new book titled The Race to Zero, How ESG Investing Will Crater the Global Financial System which I found surprisingly riveting and enlightening and packed with information. And I say surprisingly only because I expected this kind of book to cause my eyes to glaze over. The Race to Zero, I recommend it. And I have the author joining me here momentarily to talk about this critical issue. So stay tuned and don't miss this conversation. And let me say, as always, please take a moment to subscribe to The Right Take if you haven't already so that you can keep up with the important conversations we're having here with thinkers, writers, pundits, scholars, and storytellers. And if you like what you hear, a positive review would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Don't touch that dial. Welcome back to The Right Take, everybody. My guest today is Paul Tice, an adjunct professor of finance at New York University's Stern School of Business. He spent 40 years working on Wall Street at firms like J.P. Morgan Chase, Lehman Brothers, and BlackRock, specializing in the energy sector. He's an expert in climate policy, environmental regulation, and the whole ESG and sustainable investment movement, which we're going to talk about today. He's got a brand new book out, as I mentioned before, called The Race to Zero, How ESG Investing Will Crater the Global Financial System. That doesn't sound like good news. Paul Tice, welcome to the Right Take Podcast. Hi, Mark. It's good to be with you. Thanks for coming on. I have been looking forward to having you on after reading your book because I think it's incredibly important for people to be aware of this topic and to understand the whole ESG investment issue. And I will confess to you that economics and finance, that's not my bag. It's not a field that I'm especially comfortable discussing, but I think a lot of people probably feel that way. Uh, And for that reason, I didn't expect to find your book so compelling, but you have a really great facility, I think, for clarifying financial issues in clear language uh, without a lot of insider jargon. Let me begin by asking you how, excuse me, as a financial analyst who's been in the industry for decades, how and why you began focusing on the whole climate and environmental side of the business, and what made you feel that there was a need for a book like this? Yeah, well, one of the main reasons why I wrote the book um, after you know, I retired from my last day job on Wall Street um, was because you haven't heard any criticism about ESG given by anyone who actually works on Wall Street. Uh, and there's a reason for that. You're not allowed to have a, a divergent opinion when it comes to sustainability, uh, especially when the CEO of your firm is telling everyone that this is what we're going to do. But you know, I experienced that firsthand over the tail end of my career you know, the first half of my career, I worked on the sell side. The second half, I was an investor on the buy side. But for most of my career, I, I was involved with the energy sector. And, and I think the energy, the oil and gas sector is the primary target of ESG because ESG is all about climate change. You know, for all the focus on some more woke issues, um, you know, I think it's all about climate change. And, and we need to focus on what's going on in the financial markets behind the scenes. Um, you know, and that was another motivation for writing the book, because I think a lot of this is not transparent to the Amer- American public. Even if you're invested in the markets, you know, most investments over the last 15 years have been passive. So you, know, you, you allocate your money to an ETF and then you don't think about it. So 
I think a lot of the public is missing what's going on. And it's probably the biggest threat with regard to the climate change agenda. What is ESG investing exactly? And, and what, what kind of an impact is it having on uh, American business and, and government? Yeah, so ESG, um, you know, it goes by a number of different names, ESG investing, sustainable investing, responsible investing. Uh, but ESG is environmental, social governance factors. Um, and they are basically non-financial factors. Uh, it's morally subjective whether they are priorities at all. And the argument that's being made is that you should use these ESG factors to drive your company policy and your investment decision making, as opposed to objective financial metrics. Um, and then, you know, kind of the most ridiculous aspect of the argument is that if you focus on these non-financial ESG factors, it will create financial value somewhere down the road for you if you're an investor. They never actually define how long you have to wait to realize that value. But, you know, it's kind of a ridiculous premise uh, that, that, that no one's pointing out. And it's all predicated on stakeholder capitalism, um, which is a theory that's been around really for 50 years. The World Economic Forum has been the, the leading champion of this. Um, and that's the view that companies should be run not for their owners and their capital providers and their employees, but companies should be run for the good of society, for people and planet, you know, is the language that they use. And, and that, that obviously is a ridiculous premise because CEOs really are not equipped to solve the, uh, the problems of the world. That's arguably the role of government. Uh, so stakeholder capitalism is not capitalism. It may be the end stage of capitalism if we don't turn this thing around, but it's basically the government working through third party activists, including the United Nations, to direct the private sector and the financial markets. And, you know, that is basically fascism. Uh, and you can really trace ESG back to the 1930s and then all the way back to the 19th century with some of these anti capitalist movements. And this isn't just a, a trend on Wall Street, right? I mean, it's, it's fundamentally kind of changing the nature of Wall Street, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I, and I think the, uh, the shocking part is that a, a lot of the people working in the industry probably are not realizing it. Uh, you know, they're kind of missing the forest for the trees. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's owing to, you know, the dynamic on Wall Street. And you're always told to, you know, keep your head down, focus on making money. You know, the markets, you know, during my 40 years there, every four to six years, there was another crisis that we had to deal with, right? So you're always being told to keep your head down and just focus on making money. And I think that is actually getting the industry into trouble with regard to ESG, because over the last decade, really since 2015, it's, it's picked up um, the pace. Um, it has really made inroads into Wall Street. And with every passing year, it's going to be tough to, to unwind that. Um, I think one thing that's allowed ESG to, G to make such inroads was the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, you know, coming out of that, Wall Street had a really terrible image. Um, you know, again, we in in chapter four of the book, I go through, you know, exactly what happened in 2008. And, and at the time, I worked at Lehman Brothers, so I kind of had a front row seat. But obviously, the government was involved in terms of of what happened in 08 and and not basically stabilizing the system. Um, but all the blame was placed on Wall Street, and they were blamed for wrecking Main Street. And we heard that throughout the first two terms of the Obama administration. So the industry has been looking to, to work on its ethical image. And then ESG comes along and really plays to that. And the problem is that everyone has gotten suckered into that trade, and now they can't find the exit door. Um, because with every passing year you know, that you agree with sustainability, it becomes that tougher to basically say, oh, no, this is a hoax or this is not real. And that obviously calls into question, you know, your expertise. So, you know, the initial phase was to get everyone involved using moral pressure. The next phase between now and 2030 is regulation is coming that's going to mandate it for everybody. Is the ultimate agenda behind this sustainable investing to change the nature of capitalism itself? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, if you look at it, um, it's basically you're going to be using this morally subjective prism to 
allocate capital um, in the markets. And so politically favored industries, clean energy, uh, will see disproportionate flows. And then those that are out of favor, like oil and gas and, and other fossil fuels, they will be starved for capital. Um, you know, maybe you won't even have access to the market to begin with. You know, originally the, the goal was to drive up the cost of capital for energy companies. You know, we could get to the point where, you know, you, you have no access at all. Uh, and, and Europe is going to give us a good template for, for how severe this is going to be going forward since they're several years ahead of us and, and it's kind of ground zero for um, ESG and, and climate regulations. So, but this will change capital. You, you're basically going to, again, have the government working through third party activists uh, directing capital flows within the industry. Um, and that's obviously not a free market. Um, and, and one of the other ridiculous arguments, uh, aspects of the ESG argument is that, you know, everyone has to have the same view on every tenet of the program, particularly around climate change. And the only way you could have two sided uh, liquid markets uh, is if you have a divergence of opinion, because someone has to buy at the same level that someone is willing to sell. That's how markets function. But only ESG, this concept um, that's come on in the last 10 years or so, um, is immune from that. And no one ever actually explains how the markets will be you know, sustainable or even functioning under that dynamic. But we're, we're, we're getting down that road. Again, it's behind the scenes. People aren't realizing it. But there are a number of European banks that have announced that they're no longer going to be banking the oil and gas industry. Uh, eventually, that will seep into the U.S. banking market. And then from there, it's going to move into our bond market. So, you know, it's happening right now, uh, slowly. And if these regulations in this country that are coming uh, aren't reversed, then that'll make it more permanent. Who are some of the major players behind ESG investing? And are they open about their aims? Well, the, the United Nations has led uh, the charge really with regard to climate change, sustainable development, uh, since the 1980s. Um, and then in 2006, as I mentioned, the, the United Nations set up their own investor group to kind of push this agenda onto the financial markets. Um, so it's really the UN is leading on all three of these intertwined verticals with help from the World Economic Forum and then a whole global network of NGOs uh, and nonprofits. Um, but Obviously, you've got government, the member governments, particularly the European member governments, that are fully on board with this whole agenda. So, but the other side's got a, at least a 40 year head start. But ESG is kind of the last leg, the most important one, I would say, because it's the funding mechanism. You know, it's basically co opting the private sector to pay for all of these, you know, government mandates so that government doesn't have to. Um, so, and again, it's gonna change the, the, uh, the uh, nature of the market, you know, the, the type of people who work on Wall Street. You really won't need to have analytical skills going forward if you know, you're just going to allocate capital based on what a third party network is telling you. And, and that's the other thing about this. It, it, ESG removes the agency of everyone working in, in the finance industry, right? Because you can't objectively look at investments and, and determine relative value, you know, you're presented with this, this, you know, chaotic matrix of ESG factors. And from that, you know, you have to, you know, resort to uh, an outside view about, you know, how to, how to judge investments, right? And everyone agrees that climate change bad. So companies with large emissions footprints that are doing nothing to reduce that, they obviously will be the first to go. Um, but the analogy I would use again, the, the removing the agency of people who work in the industry is that it's almost going to be like playing a round of golf. And then for every stroke, you need to call in a PGA, uh, uh, official for a ruling. I mean, that's going to be a very long day on the links if you have to do that, but it's basically coming to that. You're having sustainable experts, so-called kind of chaperoning every decision with regard to trades, investment ideas, you know, a new issue on the banking side. Um, and again, they're not coming at it from an analytic, analytical perspective. There's no past performance. 
that proves that this will create value down the road. So they're just kind of coming in and issuing a diktat that, you know, this is this is either a good or a bad investment. And again, based on their morally subjective view of the world. So the subtitle of your book is how ESG investing will crater the global financial system. So is that how it's going to destroy the global financial system is by altering capitalism itself and, and the, the very nature of markets and selling and buying? Yeah, I, I think if they succeed in terms of resting control of the financial markets using this this ESG matrix, um, you know, it's going to be negative for, you know, all of the Western economies, right? Uh, but certainly the developed world. And that's the other thing to remember about ESG. It's, it's an uneven playing field. Everything with regard to climate goals, sustainable development goals, and ESG goals is applied more aggressively against developed countries, the industrialized West, North America, and Europe, and then the third world, including China and India, which you know we can have that debate about whether they're an emerging market country, um, they are held to a different standard. So this has always been kind of about a wealth transfer and more deindustrializing the West um, as opposed to addressing real problems that the world has. Right. Obviously, poverty is still a problem that we have not solved. And arguably, it hasn't gotten better in the last 30 years uh, that the U.N. has been focusing on this, you know, environmental and social agenda. Um, so but it, the negative scenario alluded to in, in, in the title of the book is basically if, if ESG succeeds in defunding oil and gas, starving the, the industry for capital, that's going to lead to less supply of energy, you know, just the law of economics, right? So that is going to lead to an increase in energy prices. And we've kind of seen pockets of that over the last couple of years. But since energy is used to make and transport everything in this economy, that is going to raise the price of food in particular and, and lead to inflation, you know, that will make the last two years under the Biden administration look like child's play. Um, so I think that's the negative scenario. And, and also, you know, if you look at some of the other aspects of this transition away from fossil fuels, which we know we can't complete, right? It's not driven by market demand. Uh, we don't have the technology to complete it as it's currently uh, programmed. Uh, and we know it's going to lead to negative issues for uh, the American public. We're going to have less reliable uh, electric grids. And if they go down in the winter, as we saw in Texas three years ago, people will die. So we're going to have less economic growth, um, you know, lower living standards, higher mortality rates, and the price of everything will be significantly higher. That is not an aggressive forecast, in my mind, for how this will play out if, you know, the ESG movement succeeds in, in starving capital to oil and gas. So no one can actually explain how that macroeconomic picture is going to be good for the financial markets. I would argue strongly that it's going to be negative. But again, this gets back to the point that everyone is kind of keeping their head down. Nobody wants to become a target, so they're not pointing out what is frankly, an obvious uh, uh, point. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up about fossil fuels. I was going to ask you, you anticipated my question about that. I was going to ask you about how ESG investing is impacting the energy sector specifically, and you, uh, you did that, unless you'd like to elaborate on that more. Um, but what impact is it having on the culture also in the larger sense? Like, how is it in, uh, connected to some of the culture war battles like um, freedom of speech? or cancel culture. Yeah, well, just, just one more point about energy. Uh, I think at least the U.S. industry has has taken steps to kind of protect itself over the last few years. Uh, obviously, they've been dealing with, with very volatile prices, and we had the crash back in 2014, and shale technology has obviously led to an oversupplied market. So the U.S. industry is, very, is much better financially in terms of living within cash flow. So by doing so, they reduce their dependence on the on the capital markets. So that gives them a layer of protection against ESG if they don't have to go to the market on a regular basis. But, you know, as I mentioned before, European banks are already starting to, to pull the plug on, on lending to uh, energy companies. And I think that will continue to escalate. And, and that, I think, is unfortunate because it's going to starve startups for capital. 
you know, the industry is not going to continue to to push out on the frontier plays to see if they're economic and, and de-risk them. So again, it's going to kind of box in the industry in terms of, of supply going forward. Um, so it will lead to, you know, much higher prices down the road. So, but um, getting back to the other question about the woke issues, um, you know, I, I think this is, again, this is another interesting uh, uh, aspect to the ESG argument. It's basically taking every progressive goal over the last 100 years and it's saying that if you follow these, if you're a company or an investor, it's going to be sustainable over the long term. You know, a sustainable company, a sustainable portfolio. And you can't argue with that because, you know, no one knows the future, right? So you get into these theoretical discussions. So it's one way that progressives don't have to talk about the historical record about implementing some of their policies from the 20th century, which went horribly wrong. Now everything is in the future and you just have to accept it as a given. Uh, but we have a number of recent examples from last year where you had certain uh, regional banks that were all in on ESG and virtue signaling. And, you know, they kind of took their eye off the ball and couldn't even manage interest rate risk. Right. So sustainability implies that uh, it makes a company a going concern and it's solvency, but it's not. You know, it's just sustainability is this issue uh, phrase that was coined that sounds good. It really is meaningless. And, and so that allows them to throw everything into uh, the hopper with regard to progressive goals. And you see a lot of that around some of these more cultural issues. And, and I don't use that phrase to, to diminish, uh, diminish the threat from some of these things, certainly for families with small children. But I think it, it helps to distract a little from the core issue that which re really needs to be climate change, because if they succeed in terms of oil and gas defunding, it's going to restrict every American's economic freedom and their living standards going forward. And, and that clearly is the goal. Uh, it's unstated, but clearly everything is choreographed towards that objective uh, by 2030, which I think is a real date for them. So a lot of the, the issues that have been described as woke, you mentioned Vivek's book, which was very good in terms of shining the light on, on what's happening. But I would say that, you know, those are in the boardroom as I mentioned before, a lot of companies are under under uh, pressure to comply, and uh, it's really, I think, the threat that they will be cut out from the financial markets that I think is hanging over their head that doesn't allow them to speak freely. Uh, let, let's talk about the Bud Light example. You know, it's shocking to me that that company still has not been able to right the ship nearly a year later, and I don't think the the ad during the Super Bowl the other week really did anything to help in that regard. Um, and I think the fact that they can't come out and actually, you know, admit uh, definitively that they made an error and it was it was done what they did on the marketing side shows you how much they are in fear of of the bigger threat, which is, you know, a defunding threat. Also, they have a European parent. Um, so Europe, again, is, is much more in sync with this ESG agenda. So that may be one reason why it's, it's driving their inability to right the ship, even though, you know, they've lost so much in revenues and market share around that brand. You mentioned Bud Light. Um, can you name another maybe prominent or concerning example, a specific example of ESG investing that people should be aware of that maybe it might not be? Um, well, the other examples I, I think we've talked about Disney, obviously, which has gotten into the battle with with uh, the governor in in, in Florida. Um, you have uh, Target in terms of some of the the uh, clothes that they've marketed to children, um, and but I, I think if you look over the last couple of years, it's a whole host of companies that have come out and and issued uh, supportive statements around what clearly are more liberal and progressive goals, um, whether it's from uh, the ruling by the Supreme Court in terms of, you know, kicking the abortion decision back to the states, or it's um, uh, some of these voter uh, regulations that have been passed since 2020 to kind of tighten up the process in certain states. Uniformly, companies are coming out 
and just issuing a statement in support, which is, again, counterintuitive because, you know, as Michael Jordan said, you know, Republicans, Democrats, they both buy sneakers, right? And we know that this company, this country is, is almost split right down the middle in terms of registered Democrats and Republicans. So why would you go out of your way to antagonize half of the population? But still, they come out and do this. And again, I think that that speaks to kind of the pressure that's being put on them. So there's there's no shortage of companies. What What's interesting is you don't have a lot of really any companies coming out the other way um, defending conservative values or challenging some of these things. And, and companies like Chick, Chick-fil-A, they get bashed almost immediately. Right. And, and a lot of them have, you know, have uh, retracted, unfortunately. So I think it just shows you the pressure that the activists have working through the threat of the financial markets being turned off. I think a lot of conservatives get complacent about these kinds of things. They, they like to think that if you go woke, if you get woke, you go broke. But is that really true? Do companies who, that go woke, do they go broke? No, and that, you know, that, again, uh, I disagree with a, a lot of the tactics that are being used up until now, even though it's good that we've, we've had some pushback on ESG the last two years. I think tactics and focus uh, need to be upgraded. But um, there are, you know, a handful of examples, you know, so Silicon Valley Bank, right? You could say it was a woke bank and uh, they failed. Um, and they were acquired by one of their competitors, right? But it hasn't changed the, the momentum of the other side, right? And the other side, you know, frankly, I think is impervious to logic, right? Um, you know, they don't believe in this whole sustainable argument. They don't believe that it's going to generate um, excess financial return if you follow this ESG agenda. Um, you know, the data is not there through no lack of trying from business schools, including my own. Um, so there's no proof that this leads to better performance, but they don't care. You know, they've started to change that argument, calling it risk adjusted return as opposed to, you know, um, nominal return. And then even now, you know, they're kind of moving towards let's focus on impact, right? Because if you focus on impact, we can measure that by how much capital is being thrown at the problem, right? How much capital is going towards clean energy, how much capital is being drawn away from oil and gas. And so that clearly is a government way of measuring uh, success. How much money do you throw at a problem? Not necessarily solving it, but but how much uh, money is being allocated to it. So, so I don't think you can use logic against the other side. Uh, no matter how many companies, you know, fail, following this agenda, it's, it's not going to change it, right? Because um, it's all about control. If you control the financial markets and the oil and fossil fuels, you control the entire capitalist system, you control every American in that process, right? Um, so I think they're impervious to logic. Um, you know, we just need to accept that. Uh, so they use a lot of terms that sound really good, like sustainability. Um, and they're acting as if it's all about improving the world and saving the planet, but really ultimately it is about control. Is that right? It is, yeah. And and, and you know, as an English major, you know, I, I'm endlessly amazed at the progressive uh, ability to to uh, manipulate the English language uh, to the, to their uh, purposes. You know, so as I mentioned before, ESG investing is also referred to as sustainable investing or responsible investing. And that was the, uh, the label that the UN went with when they set up their investor group. So obviously, if you don't join their group, you're acting irresponsibly, right? And as part of that, they've kind of uh, spun ESG as a, a risk management framework, right? Um, so again, it, it's, it implies one thing. Uh, and I think, again, it's just, it, it's just suckering a lot of people into it. Uh, but it clearly is not, you know, what it, it implies, right? Um, so I think we need to be careful about, um, you know, what's being promised and, and then call them out on, on some of these things, but there is no proof that, um, sustainable investing, uh, leads to outperformance. And if you look at all the research put out by business schools and, and they've gone back to 1970 to look at, you know, ESG. And again, that raises a number of questions because, I worked in the markets in the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s, and I can tell you nobody talked about ESG or sustainability. 
during those three decades, right? So what they're trying to do is, you know, uh, ex post go back and look at at things, say their ESG. I think what they're measuring in, in a lot of these uh, research reports is just quality. You know, better run companies outperform. That's basically the takeaway from a lot of this historical research about ESG. Um, so obviously that's flawed. But but going forward, the the ESG program is going to change, and they're telling us it's going to change. Everything has to be about net zero decarbonizing. And so whatever historical record, even if it proves something, is completely irrelevant to what the going forward is for for the ESG agenda, which, as I mentioned before, clearly is going to be negative. And we've gotten snapshots of that in Europe. Uh, and Europe wants to be the first net zero continent. Um, you know, they're going to show the way down for the rest of, of the world. Um, and they don't seem to be backing away from the edge. You mentioned the year 2030 as a sort of a deadline. You, you write in the book about something you call the Iron Curtain of Sustainability and that it will fall into place on Wall Street by the year 2030. Can you explain that? Yeah, so I mentioned that all three of these UN uh, programs are intertwined and they all have a 2030 um, uh, milestone. Uh, so climate change, obviously, there are some aggressive targets that need to be hit by the world in terms of emissions reductions by 2030. Sustainable development, the, the, the UN 17 sustainable development goals, the goal is to achieve all of them by 2030. Um, and then with ESG, the goal is to create a sustainable global financial system by 2030. So I think between now and then, the pressure of uh, the regulatory policy is going to ratchet up uh, in order to, to hit that milestone. And I think one thing that, that we need to do is, is acknowledge that the other side is not going to back away from it. There are too many people, too many governments uh, that have so much vested political and personal capital in this that they're not going to back away, no matter how much you point out that it's illogical or the data don't support this. Um, you know, they take it as a given that they're going to keep going. So I think we have to treat 2030 as a real deadline in the mind of the people that are that are driving policy around this. Um, and by 2030, again, I mentioned uh, some of the net zero targets, but but the U.S. and and Europe both want to reduce emissions by roughly 50 to 55 percent versus 1990. Okay, that's going to lead to much less economic growth, and we we kind of see that stagnation in Europe over the last several years. Um, and then what's happened in Germany, which used to be the driver of of, of the European Union. And now it's it's the sick man on the block. Um, so it gets back to my original point. If you are decarbonizing, you're deindustrializing, right? And that's going to lead to higher unemployment and lower living standards and unreliable electricity grids, which is not something we've had to deal with for more than 100 years. But, you know, to point out the illogic of the other side around this crusade, they are putting intermittent wind and solar generation into all of the regional grids in this country and then over in, in Europe. Um, and they're intermittent by definition. Um, at the same time, they're pushing out coal. They're not allowing natural gas to come in and take that place. And away from a few countries in Europe, certainly not in this country, nuclear is not an option because, oh, it's, it's got its other safety issues, right? So there's always something with regard to a fossil fuel or, or something like nuclear, which is zero emissions. Again, it points to the logic and inconsistency of the argument on the other side. But, you know, th that's crazy to electrify your entire economy at the same time that you're making your electricity grids much more unreliable. And the only way to plug that that problem is through demand management. And that's just a, a nicer way of saying power outages, right? <laughs> and that's going to include residents, not just industry. And we saw in Texas how even with that demand management, it leads to unintended consequences and we couldn't get gas supplied to some of the generators. And again, you know, close to 300 people died uh, because of the cold. Do I understand correctly that there is the beginning of a pushback now underway in the United States and Europe against climate policies, a sort of a 
what they call a green lash, a green backlash, and why it has it taken so long for any resistance to mount against this this movement on Wall Street and, and among the public at large? Yeah, well, I, I don't think there's a pushback within the industry, again, because people aren't allowed to, to speak up about it. Uh, there's been a pushback from without the financial industry in this country, mainly led by people like Vivek and and uh, and uh, people in government on the Republican side. Um, there have been, you know, you know, recently reports that some of the Wall Street firms are backing away from some of their ESG commitments. You had the story yesterday about BlackRock. Um, you know, Larry Fink came out recently saying he's not going to use the, the uh, phrase ESG anymore because it's become so politicized. Again, it was always political. So, but, you know, I think that's a way to tactically retreat, frankly. And, and a few of the firms have, have withdrawn from these net zero clubs, which required them to, to start, you know, kicking oil and gas and fossil fuels out of their portfolios. They've left those net zero clubs because they have legal liability, right? Clearly, they are in violation of antitrust law in this country. And so they are withdrawing so that they don't get sued, at least with regard to that. But they probably will be acting the same way, just coming to that decision uh, on their own. And they've kind of said as much as they've withdrawn. You know, JP Morgan was one of the firms on the asset management side, which recently withdrew. And they said, well, now we have the resources to make our own decisions in-house, which you know, they always had those resources. So my guess is that they're going to have the same policies, but just say we came to this of our own thinking. So everyone gets to the same place. It's just, you know, you can't be sued in the process. So I think a lot of what you're seeing in the headlines, at least within finance, has been kind of a tactical retreat for the moment, waiting for regulations to come down the pike uh, to make it mandatory for everybody. Over in Europe, you see some pushback by uh, disaffected parts of the population, farmers in the Netherlands, um, industry over in Germany, you know, they're wrestling uh, with the definition of, of what is a sustainable economic activity because the EU has this taxonomy where they went through like every part of the economy and said, this is sustainable, that's not sustainable. And again, that's to drive capital towards the, the sustainable activities. So there's a method to that madness, but you know people are having debates about natural gas and nuclear. Uh, you know, so they're you know temporary skirmishes. It doesn't change the momentum. Again, no one's backed away from the fact that the continent wants to reduce emissions by 55 percent uh, by 2030, and and no one's backing away from shutting down farms in the Netherlands, right? Which is a crazy because the Netherlands feeds the rest of Europe. Um, but that shows you how extreme this, this whole climate agenda has gotten because now it's moving on also to agriculture and nitrous oxide, which is an even more trace uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and methane. And we're saying that, that now that also has to be cut further and we're going to stop feeding the population in order to save the planet. And it's just insane. You mentioned that there's no pushback within the industry. Is it possible for businesses in the industry to do that, to push back against ESG investing, or is that just suicide for them? Well, the fact that no one really has, I think, kind of speaks to the fact that it is it is suicide. You're going to call into, you're going to become the target. Um, if you don't have the support of your board, maybe that's a problem for you if you're the CEO. Um, so I, I think a lot of companies, no matter what the industry is, uh, but certainly with energy, would prefer not to get into that public battle. And that, I think that's unfortunate. One of the things I go through in the book, I think, is that the, the U.S. oil and gas sector um, you know, has, a, has a unique platform to speak out about this. And, and that's more than just saying fossil fuels will be around for decades, right? Um, you know, we need to reverse all of these climate regulations because the data is flawed. There is no science or scientific consensus that man is changing uh, the world's climate systems, right? And some of the scientists now are finally starting to speak out a little more aggressively. They, ha they have the same culture, cancel culture issue within the academic sphere that we have in business too. But that started to change recently. And there are studies coming out, you know, 
basically saying that temperature has been the driver of CO2, not the reverse. If that's true, then that all these climate regulations and the trillions of dollars we've spent uh, have been to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Um, and I think more people need to speak bluntly about that reality. Uh, there's, a, there's a declaration that's been going around the last couple of years, a climate declaration basically to the effect that there is no climate emergency. It's got more than 1,800 scientists who have signed it by now. Okay, that will continue to grow. So this whole idea that there's a climate consensus has been a false premise, you know, for the last 10 years. Um, and more people, more lay people, more everyday Americans need to be confident to speak out about that and not just dismiss climate change as kind of a punchline for a joke, which it is. I mean, there's a lot to laugh at here, but but the other side is not stopping. And, and we need to really build uh, the momentum to push back on it. The energy sector speaking out for itself and defending itself will help. Uh, and everyday Americans putting pressure on their lawmakers will also help. Yeah, it's literally deadly serious. Um, yeah, is there anything that the average citizen can do? You just mentioned, you know, speaking uh, speaking out about this and pushing back against the lawmakers. Is there everything? Is there anything rather that the average person can do to stop this ESG behemoth? Yeah, well, you you control your money, right? So don't patronize any company that doesn't align with your values. So that's an easy one. Uh, and the same logic goes for your investment advisor. If, you know, whoever is managing your money is out there spouting all of these ESG uh, um, policy lines, and then take your money elsewhere, right? So those are easy. But again, I, I think it's really going to get down to uh, the whole climate change argument. Uh, I think people should educate themselves a little. I think intuitively most Americans know that that the whole climate change argument is a scam. Um, and, you know, people are, are fairly good pointing out all the, the, the previous uh, scaremongering that, that it didn't come true. But, you know, we're 40 years into this now and they're not backing off. So again, to my point, logic's not going to work with them. Debating them is not going to work. Um, they will probably just ignore all the rational arguments against it. So we need to, you know, get politicians on the right side of this issue to start leading the charge. So again, you know, there are a lot of problems in this country right now. I'm, I'm not going to minimize any of them. Um, inflation, the economy, the border. Um, but climate change needs to stay at the top of everyone's mind because again, this is coming, you know, and it, some of these, you know, wilder theories about 15 minute cities, those are happening now over in Europe, right? So they're coming here. There are a lot of cities that align with with that way of thinking. So even though the federal government may not be doing anything, it's being pushed in blue states and cities, right? And a lot of these anti-fossil fuel regulations are being implemented at the state level. You know, up here in the Northeast, you know, New York has passed laws that would not allow natural gas infrastructure and in new construction, right? Furnaces, stoves. You know, the federal government is, is not allowing you to have a fossil fuel generator going forward. Everyone knows we can't build natural gas pipelines in this country anymore. Um, you know, uh, the Northeast up in New England, they have to import LNG uh, from the third world, Trinidad, in order to service their gas needs because we can't build a pipeline across New York State. So this whole climate ESG agenda is already being implemented at the state level. And eventually the federal government, I think during the second term of, of a Biden administration, God forbid if we get there, I think then it would, it's going to become much more aggressive in terms of the push. But you can see California too as kind of a, the leading edge of this, right? Um, you know, they're mandating a lot of things with regard to emissions, disclosures, you know, you can't drive an ICE vehicle. Um, you, know, you know, I think they're trying to use California to direct the rest of the country. So it's happening, you know, it's seeping into our economy uh, and people need to focus on it. Very interesting and very scary. Paul, how can people best keep up with what you are doing? Are you a social media guy? Yeah, um, you can uh, see the stuff I write on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. That's probably the easiest thing. And, you know, you can also reach me through uh, NYU Stern. Um, so, but I'm gonna keep speaking out on this. The, the book is the first step. Um, and I think, you know, again, this is kind of a pressing economic, you know, uh, political issue. 
for this country over the next uh, six plus years, and we need to get it right. Absolutely. Paul Tice, thanks for coming on The Right Take to break it down for a financial dummy like me. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Listeners, get a copy of The Race to Zero by Paul Tice, that's T-I-C-E, and dive into it. You will not regret it. Thank you for joining me here at the intersection of politics and culture. Don't forget to subscribe to The Right Take so you can keep up with all the important conversations we're having here. And again, if you like what you hear, please leave that positive review. Be seeing you. The Right Take with Mark Tapson is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine. Unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.